Okay, good morning, everybody. Good Friday, Good Friday, Good Hanukkah. A lot of alignment and good energies today. <laughs> blessing, a lot of blessing. So we hope that we can be a, a vessel together to channel whatever good and blessing there is in the world. Now it seems like the world needs it with all the reports we get uh, today on the news. Seems like uh, every day, members turn on the news and there's some violent attack about Jews in America, literally every day. It's hard enough to be aware of that, uh, take that energy in with us to the session today, so we'll see how we can channel all this awareness for good, for blessing itself. In the line that we say after we light the Hanukkah candles, the name is Hallelujah. We say this very strange, ambiguous term. The name is Hallelujah. Kodesh Haim. The Ain Lanovish Lanovishus. The Ishtamesh Behem. These uh, candles are Kodesh. They are this very poor English translation. Holy. And we don't have permission to, to use them. <sighs> it's a very weird idea that the Hanukkah light is so holy that we, we can't actually use it. It's actually in the Halakha in the, the basic level of Jewish law, that uh, you're not supposed to use the light for anything but looking at the light.
I was going to qualify that with the menorah lights, but really that's, that's, the, that's the essence of what I want to explore with you today. You're supposed to have another light on the moon. We can't sit and learn and read by the light of the menorah. We can't use the menorah to light up the room. In many houses, and most houses, as far as I know, you have another light on in the room. You have to have another light on next to the next to the menorah. That is the light that is illuminating this world. The light through which we can see this world that reflects onto the physical world. So I say, here is the table and here is the chair, so I don't bump into the furniture. I can see my kids when I'm speaking to them, if I want to learn Torah by the Hanukkah lights, so then I'm learning Torah, but my, my book <coughs> is illuminated not by the light of the menorah, but by the, the normal light in the room. <coughs> this is the deepest of deep teachings. And uh, why, why is it that, what is it about the, can the Hanukkah light? that it can't be used as a reflective light. It is really a source light. There's two kind of lights in the world. One is a source light and one is a reflective light. One is a source light in the fact that, one is a reflective light in the fact that all light we see in the world is reflective, really. When we see anything in the world, it's because there's light bouncing off it, which allows us, enables us, us to see. But the Hanukkah, the essence of Hanukkah, is the idea to see the light itself, to see the source of the light itself, and to know that there's something in this world called light that we, that is worthy of, of existing for itself, even if it serves of no other temporal benefit. And as this is Hanukkah, this is actually the instructions that the greatest mystics of our tradition wanted us to know that this is how we confront darkness. How we confront darkness is to turn our attention from the light which is reflected to the source of light itself because there's sometimes in this world that the light of the reflection is no longer visible. And at those times, we can only access light, access truth, access goodness, access salvation, access blessing, access strength, access courage to having the capacity to turn to the source of light itself. And this, like all things in Torah, is really not just a Devar Torah. It's a mechanism of consciousness. It's the fundamental teaching of all real meditation. is that you should know that most of what you're seeing in the world is just reflected light. It's just the reflection of, of consciousness into the world rather than the source of consciousness itself. Every time you go online and you log into Facebook, you log into the news, you're not seeing the source of light itself in the world. You're seeing how the light gets reflected and refracted and distorted in the physical reality. When you're in close relationships and the relationships break down, you'll always see 100% of the time. You're no longer dealing with the person, the source of their light. You're dealing with their light refracted, refracted, reflected, distorted through their midas, through their pain, through their doubt, through their ego, through their lust. Or you yourself are no longer acting from your own source of light. You are acting through a distortion of that distorted through your own fears and doubts and lusts and egos and desires, etc., etc., yourself. And the reason that the Hanukkah light is different from all other lights, Hanerah's Hadalu Kodesh Haim is because they are a Kodesh. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. They are holy. And this is the definition of holy. It's not necessarily to have a hat or long payas or to shuckle while we daven. Definition of holy is to live life in a state of consciousness whereby you experience directly the source of light 
and attune your, your, your will and your focus and your motivation and your perception to source light rather than to reflect it light. I was once, many, many years ago, when I first started out in Yeshiva, I was walking through the old city with a rabbi and a bunch of students. I'd been in Yeshiva for a few years, and some of these guys were fresh off the boat, as they say. And one guy turned to the rabbi and said, what does it mean, holiness? What does holiness mean from a Torah perspective? And the rabbi said something, and when he said something, I thought, oh, that's such a lame cure of the answer. Oh, that's, you know, so it's not really what it means. He said the definition to this young man, he said the definition of holiness means to live with uncompromising dedication to your highest self. To live with uncompromising dedication to your highest self to your ultimate self, to your ultimate potential. And I thought that's a very nice, sweet thing to say. There's, you know, there's a lot of Torah sources on Kabbalah of, of holiness and what holiness really means. It's not just a new age kind of self-improvement thing to live dedicated to your true self. And then I thought about it. And then I spent years learning about it. And I realized that is a genius definition of holiness, which is right on target. The Ramchal says very clearly that, that, that holiness is a, is, a double, is a double language. It implies two things. One, it means precious to separate, to separate from that which is lower. And then it means the second is to dedicate, so to speak, to, to live in a way that completely expresses. Well, let's talk this out for a second. Holiness does mean to live in a way that's uncompromising to your higher self. And when I think of holiness, I thought of like these kind of Buddhist monks that, you know, lived amongst the elderberries without, you know, 50 years not eating and kind of, you know, it's completely detached from any desire, any emotion at all. And then in a Jewish context, you know, it's all these rabbis, they don't eat, they don't drink, as, as the as sages say, you know, all they do is they learn Torah, they eat bread and they eat salt, they sleep on the ground, you know, they're there. You know, what is this thing that they're doing? Well, it's basically unappealing to most people in this generation and to be most healthy people in this generation. I've definitely had parts of my life where I've tried to pursue that on my own little level. What it is, is realizing that, that all human beings basically have a dual nature to their consciousness. And the dual nature to our consciousness is called the Nefesh el versus the Nefesh Bahamas. The higher self versus the lower self. The ego self versus the divine self. The Das Elion versus the normative Das Tachton. In the language we, we just explored together in the previous session, Elevation and the Citizen Kabbalah, etc. And what you realize is that most of the times we define ourselves by all the thoughts, all the feelings, all the lust, all the ego, all the jealousy, all the pain that we carry within us. And they inform our thoughts and they inform our feelings and they inform our actions. Of course, therefore, they perform, they, they, they inform our perceptions. As, as perceptions is the, really the core of, of the true personality, which is as the information comes in, the true personality is who you are that you will choose to respond. But there's a filter system on your true personality, which is your false personality, which is your, your das tafton, which is your fallen self. And when a person realizes that I want to live according to my highest light, my highest truth, my highest essence, then a person has to first attune themselves to what that is, to where those sensitivities are, to where that light is. That's number one. And then we have to attune ourselves to what is the noise that gets in the way that distorts my perceptions, and therefore informs my actions, which isn't the real me, my das is in gollus, my consciousness in exile. I think I, this is who I am, but it's not really who I am. With the real me, the real das, please stand up. So this idea that we have a dual self, and this, the, the Mohemes HaYetzer, the Battle of the Yetzirah, as it's known by from our sages for thousands of years. The essence of, of holiness is, is to be machnia, the first step of precious, of separation, is to be machnia, is to subdue the voices within me that say, 
this is who you are and that aligned to us. This is what you want. I want to scream at my husband because I, he's such an idiot. I want to destroy him. And well, is that really me? Where's my sublimeness? Where's my patience? Where's my sensitivities? Is this the best way to transform someone? Is this going to be helpful? Where, where is the higher self, the more aware self, the more conscious self, the more mindful self? And the answer is it's an exhale under the rest of that noise. So then the beginning of consciousness, of development of consciousness, of what we call the development of DAS, is the awakening to the fact that usually the desires within my consciousness are not the true the desires, and the noise within my mind is not the true me, and there's a me that is the higher me, that's called the Kodash me, the holy me, which is known in Kabbalah and Hasidus as being the realms of Chochma and Das Elyon, Chochma and Keta. That's why when you, when you have that spiritual experience, we've discussed before, this is a little Kabbalistic, I don't want to cover this ground too much. Right now, where we have different people from different backgrounds, different levels of awareness and knowledge, so I don't want to confuse people. But in Kabbalah, there's always this idea that there's Esos Sphiros. Esos Sphiros, there's 10 Sphiros, there's 10 primary energies of the reality and 10 primary energies of our consciousness, faculties of human consciousness. And in the Kabbalistic language, based on Sefi Yitzhira, we say that there's, there's 10 and there's not 11, and there's 10 and there's not 9. I don't know if, if there's any kind of Monty Python fans, but you know that there's a, there's a holy grail. That they, what was it called? The holy hand grenade of Antioch, and you have to throw it at, at 3 or 4. I can't remember the number words, but it's 4 and not 3, and 4 and not 5. It's, as if math is that complex that we have to break it down. Thank you, Sefi Yitzhira. You said there's 10. There's not 11. Thank you for reminding me there's not 11. I'm sure there's also not 12. It would be a very long book if we had to list all the numbers something wasn't. How old are you today? Well, I'm not one, I'm not two, I'm not three, I'm not four. Now, there's actually a process when you ask a woman in her 50s, how old is she? She also doesn't want to answer. She wants to say, I'm not 20 and I'm not 21, I'm not 22. She has to bring herself emotionally up to acknowledging with the ages she is. I think a lot of men feel the same way. But there's a deeper idea. In Kabbalah, if it's saying that there isn't something, it's because there's a hava amina, there's an assumption, if you're sensitive, that there could be. And if you add, add up all the spheres, Keta, Chachma, Bina, Das, Kesin, Gavur, Tepez, Netzach, like you said, Malchus, you will count 11. <laughs> Joke's on us. So the reason there's 11 is there isn't 11, there's really only 10. Now we understand what the Sefi Yitzhir is saying. So wait a second, I thought there's, there's 10 and not 11. So the answer is, as we all know, because Das Elyon, higher consciousness and lower consciousness, Das Elyon and Das Tacton are never counted together. I'm not going to spend too long on this, don't worry, I don't want to lose people. But some people are into this and it's good for them to hear this. That means you either have Keta Chochman Bina, and then Chesed Gavot Teferis, or you have Chochman Bina and Das, Chesed Gavot Teferis. And if you're following a little what I'm saying so far, I want to make sure if this is interesting to some, or fine. Fascinating. Now, a lot of times people don't really understand. A lot of people I've met that have been learning these stories for many years, and they all have, what does that mean? They can give over all the explanations, the perushim about why you don't count Keta and you don't count Das. But if you really want to understand it, I was going to say you should have an ayahuasca experience, LSD experience, or you should meditate properly. Use the first two, because that's, for better or for worse, how a lot of people reference these things in our generation. When you have a, 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 a profound meditational experience, people experience this, I see a lot in elevation meditation seminars and retreats and these kind of things, but people have experienced them in their lives in many different ways. There's a point of meditation when you, you get beyond mindfulness. Again, mindfulness is only at best an introduction, but it's not more sophisticated than that. <sighs> when you launch beyond yourself and you are no longer conscious of yourself. And when you are no longer conscious of yourself, you transcend yourself, you become one with the cosmic reality or one with the spirit or one with the divinity within you or one with the Nefesh Elikis. This Devakis. Devakis means that your Davik, your essential self, is so bonded and unified with something beyond self that you lose your awareness of self. And then when you come back to your body, you come back to your consciousness, you're in a state called Lamalaman is man, Lamalaman and Markham, hired outside of time and outside of place and outside of self. So this is the reason in Kabbalah that you don't count them together because when you are in your normal consciousness, you can believe as a religious 
dogmatic assumption or, you know, an interesting reasonable assumption and on the same consciousness that there is a higher part of my mind that's one with all the reality. And, you know, a soul, I believe that I have a soul. I believe there is a God. And I have lots of beliefs about stuff. And I've learned a lot of Torah so I can explain it. I can sound eloquent and intelligent about it. Um, and all these kind of things. But then there's experience when you literally just launch and you're gone and you're at one with all of reality. In that one with all of reality, you're not even conscious of yourself. You're not even conscious of your lower self or yourself in a body. And then I, I, as you ha sometimes what happens is they go, they go, oh my gosh, I'm having a spiritual experience. And that awakening of the ego self I'm having spiritual experience actually displaces them from that higher place because they've fallen back to the person that's aware I'm having spiritual experience and therefore at that moment I'm no longer having a transcendent experience. So so that 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 is the 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 mechanism of consciousness. From my own consciousness, I can understand that the Kabbalistic reality of why you never have Keta and Das together. Because as long as you are fully aware of yourself. And your problems, or your issues, or your sophistication, or your contribution, your growth, and you're very, very holy, and you're praying, and you're learning, you're growing, doing kindness. It's still me doing kindness, me learning, me growing, me developing, me meditating. And that can be very important and beautiful and wonderful and necessary. And the reality is most of us live, live our lives there. So then you don't really have Keta. You don't really have Das Elion because you're not conscious of it at that time. But at the moments when you enter into Keta, then you have Keta Chokhman Bina. Because then that light is informing and transforming the Chokhman Bina, and your mitters are expanding or silence, depending on where you are, the degree of the meditation you're doing. But then, you, then the, the self, the ego self, the das tacton closes down. And then that's the deeper explanation of what it means they're never counted together because they're not really there to exist together. Of course, as we discussed in last session, that the perfection of consciousness, the perfection of, mass, of humanity, malahad's day as a shem, is when they will actually unify as one. Therefore, the individual will exist as a complete conscious being simultaneously at one with the cosmic divine reality. And the, the, the fantastic dichotomy of, of infinite self and prati self and individual self will exist as one. I'm a drop in the ocean, but I'm aware that I'm a drop and I'm aware of the ocean. That that is a, a supernatural property, which is the ideal and is the goal and will be the destiny of humanity, but we're not there yet. And therefore, that was a short, that was a long way, a long short <coughs> way to just understand that duality of Das Eli and Das Tachtan. That's why they're never the same, understand why they're, they're never included as one, because they're not really experiencing one at this state in consciousness. So there is 11 there, but it's really only 10, because you only function as 10. But as we, as we achieve our individual perfection and our global perfection, eventually those 10 will still be 10, but the two will be united as one. So doubling back to the idea of Kodesh, what does it mean holy? Holy is... is when you're so fully aware of, of the source light itself, that all the parts of your consciousness that are just reflected light, you identify as reflected light. But they don't limit your perception or define your actions. Like you're sitting there and you're having a conversation with someone very important. It's taking you three weeks to make this appoint appointment and you're there and you're, this person's going through a challenge, you're giving them your heart and soul. And then all of a sudden, your phone buzzes in your pocket. And then you detach your attention from that being and you suck it down into the, into the phone. And if I say you what was more important, a random message from someone you didn't even know that you had to detach your consciousness from there and put it to there, or this being in front of you. Now, everyone would say the being in front of you, right? And if you wouldn't say that, so we have therapists waiting outside to help you. <laughs> So the interesting part is we would say that, but our mechanism, our body still reaches to our pocket because that's our conditioning, that's our habit, that's our, our training for better and worse. So this goes over again and again, but we just think, oh, besides my phone addiction and besides my food addiction, I'm, I'm working on that essay, I'm writing that class, I'm, I'm working that big thing for work, and I'm in it and suddenly, oh, I'm hungry, I have to go to the fridge, open it up and just stare into it for 25 minutes, right? And there's nothing there and I close the fridge and I walk around in the circle and I open it up again and try for a second time. Maybe there's something now that just manifested. So this idea 
is that is because I'm making decisions based on what is coming up from within me. Rather than that which is beyond me, that transcends me. And I think, well, that's just my issue with eating, and that's just my issue with cell phone addiction, and that's just my issue with overworking, and that's my issue of, you know, getting angry at my wife, and that's just my issue of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't realize that this is so pervasive in my consciousness that it literally defines 98% of what my conscious mind is doing at any given moment. And what Kodesh means is that I can transcend the consciousness of desire to the consciousness of source and act and perceive from that place solely. And when I do that, I know myself on a much more profound level and I interact with reality in a totally different level. So what the mystics are doing that are trying to sleep on the floor and eat bread with salt and refrain from actions that are awakening desire is or is not, depending on who you are on your journey, the goal of what we need to do in this generation. But there's something very, very profound. Many times I hear from people, often women that say, I think we're talking about in the last session, it's much easier to not eat at all than it is to eat healthily. I think we've all experienced that in different ways. And that's exactly the point. Because when I cleanse myself completely from desires and I go, no, that's bad, and this is what I want. But when I have to enter into it, I crash underneath it. I collapse under the weight and burden of desire and the imagery that it comes, the midas and the dunyana surrounding. <laughs> so the definition of Kedusha, the definition of Kedusha, is that a person lives uncompromisingly, dedicated uncompromisingly to their true self, to their source self. That means they... I'm going to use a dangerous word. Don't try this at home psychologically. But this is the language our sages use. But we, if you do this destructively, it's very unhealthy. You have to break your desires, break your emotions. That, that sounds like more force is necessary than, than we think. What's the wrong approach? But the more you break your animalistic habits, the more you, you, you shatter the, the neural networks and the, the, the wiring, the programming they have, then the more you are free to be aware of your true self, your true desires, your true essence, and then act, then perceive and then act from that place. And that's really why all those, all those great Siddiquim, they go against their nature. They're constantly going against their nature. They're constantly choosing against their nature. Right? They're constantly stopping every decision and saying, what action does my body want to do and how am I going against that? Because what they're trying to do is cut the, the, the automatic animalistic kind of neural programming and try and find the self that perceives, that, that conceives, that, that receives on a deeper level than just the, the usual automated consciousness. And therefore, what they're doing at that moment in that way is in any person who steps forward and asks them for something or, or moves towards them and suggests something and, and, or their desire comes up an opportunity for something, rather than saying, oh, here it is, I want that, I imagine that, and I see that, I'm going to act like this, I'm going to get jealous or angry or hurtful or lustful or desirous, or, and I'm going to do that. What they do is they break the habit, and at that moment, hachna, they, 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 they lessen that, they bring that down. And then suddenly there's an expansiveness to be able to draw from a deeper place in awareness. And the more you cut all that automatic, unconscious way of behaving, of thinking, talking, speaking, then the more you expand into what's called Chachma, into Kedusha, into the area of transcendence, in the area of your infinite light, your infinite soul, your infinite potential of yourself and the potential of that moment, of the revelation yourself, or the revelation of the moment, and that massively informs what you perceive, and what you perceive massively informs whole new opportunities and windows for your actions in the world. Is anyone following so far? You're following so far a little bit? Hands up if you're following a little bit. Great. Here's where it gets interesting. As you may have heard me say many times, the essence of free will is not a choice between two desires. It's a choice between two perceptions. The secret to taking control of your power to choose is by realizing it's not a choice between desires, between like the good angel and the bad angel. 
do I eat the pork or not eat the pork? Do I scream at that person or not scream at that person? The essence is, is, is to realize it's really a choice between two perceptions. Your power is in your perception. Your power for transformation begins in your perception. Once you perceive there's a split in reality, then the Yetzirah has a compelling <laughs> argument. Once you perceive this person in front of you is just pulled in front of your lane is absolutely an idiot and completely incompetent and a moron, then you, you, you know, I could yell at him and wipe him off the road. I could be nice to him for five minutes before he does it again in five minutes and then I'll bump him off the road. But you're already living in the in Alma de Peruda, the world of fra fragmentation. The choices that you have indicate the state that you live in. The choices that are before you at any moment indicate the state that you live in because the state indicates your perception and the perception indicates your options. I'm feeling stressed and anxious. I can go to bed and not binge or I could binge. My state indicates my perception, and my perception will indicate the choices of my actions. Now listen very carefully. If I can, I'm trying to say something deep, I don't know if I can get a handle on it right now. I feel it's coming down in the right way, so I'm just going to ride the wave, and we'll see where it goes together. I'm feeling anxious. Now, are you anxious or feeling anxious? What's the important distinction? Is there a way of a self that is different from the anxiety, or am I just consumed by anxiety? If I'm consumed by anxiety, I won't have a choice and the game is off already. If there is a self that's perceiving anxiety, now I, I'm in a battle. I can binge. I can get that chocolate ice, the tub of chocolate ice cream. I can get the chips, the popcorn, the Oreos cookies. I'm from Australia. I don't even know what Oreos cookies are. It's one of those things I heard about in movies. I don't know if they're kosher, I don't know if I just suggested something trace, then don't eat obvious cookies, you definitely shouldn't. What are cookies? What is cake? What is ice cream? They are divine sparks of revelation. That's what they are. And each of them is a window to transformative light and divine revelation and devakis. In the same way that we've learned together that according to the Bhagavad Gita, the Hebrew letters, if you open up to heal him, if you open up the prayers and you tune in with the light, and we've done this, we've done this with hundreds of people in the room and the light that comes into them, floods them, it releases the anxiety, it releases the pain, it releases the fear. But at that moment, because your consciousness is exiled, you can't perceive divinity in all things, and you certainly can't perceive divinity in chocolate cake, because when you look at chocolate cake, all you see is I'm burying myself in pleasure. Uh, and that's the most physical pleasure. And even though five minutes after you eat that chocolate cake, you will feel resentful and frustrated and more and anxiety, etc., etc. At that moment, you have a choice between the tub of pleasure and burying myself in pleasure or going to sleep feeling anxious and depressed. And everybody will always choose pleasure over pain 99.9% .9 of the time. You have to have a tremendous amount of free will to choose otherwise. And even though scientifically and according to Torah, it's hard that, to, to imagine that, to perceive that most people can, can access that level of will and power, especially when they're depleted in a place of catness, of moichen, of, of uh, ego depletion in that moment. So because your state is compromised, you're far from Yishevadas, and you're million miles away from Devakis, then the option of ice cream now seems very compelling. But what is the thing that you're looking at? What you're looking at is the reflected light, but not the source of light itself. The source of light is the divine light that emanates from the ice cream. According to the, the Mo'oi Nayim, the, 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 the pleasure itself contains, the taste itself is where the divine sparks are hidden. It's because it gives you so much pleasure, that's a proof of how much divinity is in it. But you're not perceiving the divinity, you're blinded by the ref refracted light, the reflected light. When the person cuts you off in traffic, 
I'm saying that because my driver all the way here just complained about every single person went in front of him and he was screaming and yelling and yelling and screaming and they, I thought one second he was going to start ramming people off the road. Then he started playing the game when he came next to him and he's like, it's an hour, my better's an hour. Okay, he's a Jew. But the next one, he was an hour. Okay, he was also a Jew. Right? So then the racism comes in now, we'll get everything all together. And that's exactly the Torah. That's exactly the point. Is that when you lose your neshama, you lose your kedusha. Kadash and Kedusha is a code word for Debekas and Das Elyon. That, that's what they're called. When you access your own Kedusha, you access your higher state, your higher awareness. When you fall from that place, then you start perceiving the world as a fragmented world. You only see physicality, not spirituality. You don't see the, the Chachman, the Sekel Shibba, the Devar, the light within all things. You don't see him, the driver, pulled it in front of you. You had the Chutzpah, as a Chutzpah to get in front of your lane, like he just invaded your country and, and you know... <laughs> pillage the whole civilization that, that that's what he needs to be so now when i look at him you know there's that thing that when, when anger flares anger always wants to blame something he's always looking to point right when hurt I, who hurt me who made me angry so you always see this thing i always see it's very profound that the second that someone pulls in front of you and then you yell at them and they pull out and into another lane the second you pass them you have to see who they are <laughs> i need to see their face i need to know it's, it's a woman driver i knew it'd be what okay, it's a man it's a man driver though oh, it's okay it's a jewish man oh. Right, because I, I need to, I need to slap a label on who am I going to hate, who am I going to diminish through this? Who had the chutzpah to invade my country? Okay, you came in front of my lane for one second to avoid a bike, but that's not the point. And the point is right now is that I'm blind. I'm blind. That's the point. Desire destroys our capacity to perceive the truth. Truth. That's the point. Now I, I want to say something. I, I don't know. If I can get this out in the right way. <laughs> We need to be willing when we confront darkness to see the world and the source of light as the tactless, as the end of the as the end of the and the purpose rather than the reflected light in this world. I'm going to change subjects now, but in some way this is going to come together. I don't see how yet, but I bet that it will. I learned a very deep talk about Hanukkah this week in a marketing meeting. We're meeting with this kind of marketing guru for elevation. It's very, very fascinating learning about how marketing works and consciousness works and all these kind of fun things. And he said a certain term this week in a certain meeting. And he's, you know, he's a, he's a really nice guy. He's a very sweet guy. He has decades of, you know, very high level marketing experience for like top corporations in the world. And he's got his game down. And he said a line this week, he just kind of threw it out. When he said that, I was just like, my head kind of exploded, not about marketing, but about Kabbalah and consciousness and Kanaka. And he was talking about, you know, the strategy of knowing who your competition is and wiping them out. This is a very Jewish approach to things, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when you're teaching meditation. Who are we going to destroy today? <laughs> So every time he says this, I'm going to smile to myself and go, okay, we'll, we'll take or leave this one. Let's see where it's going. But, you know, he, he does this thing called creating a competitive matrix. It's a brilliant marketing thing, which is like you, you map out who are the competitors and what values do they have, what values do you have. And, and this is the word he used, and I thought this is really, really profound. I'm not saying I, 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 I encourage this as a marketing technique, um, but uh, it was very profound. He, he said, what you do is you find out what your, your competitors are, and then you find out what they do, and then you find out what the angle is that you do, which is better than them, and then you, you bring them up and you, you basically wipe them out. The term, the term he uses, you turn the lights out on each of them, one at a time. You turn the lights out on each of them one at a time. And when he was saying this, I was just thinking, I began thinking like marketing perspective, I was going, marketing perspective, it's like, oh yeah, that, that's what's happening in marketing, now I kind of get it. You know, I was watching this, there's this guy, Jordan Peterson. Does anyone know who he is? So he's a very interesting character. I think he's brilliant and interesting. He's kind of very flawed, which is kind of makes him more fun. 
Um, a lot of what he says makes sense and some of it doesn't and you know, but it's interesting. So he has this personality course. So I was I watched a couple of these videos of the personality course. So he's very into something called vis 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 personality typing, the big five. And and he gets very angry about the Myers Briggs system. And you can like it, you can not like it, but anyone's getting very angry. It's like the Myers-Briggs system did something to his mother. I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but he's really, really angry. It's, and if you like him, it's kind of endearing when he gets angry. If you don't, you're like, I'd be suspicious, you know, about that degree of anger about any personality system. But what he does is he brings up the big five and he gives you this really brilliant analysis of why the big five is the only personality system of any value in the world. And he's a smart cookie, okay? So he's really breaking this down. He goes through that analytical model of how it was created and how it was constructed and all the research of 30 years and all. It's a very clever kind of guy. You send up 400 questions and you work out them and you kind of kind of crunch together what are the patterns and the answers and that. You kind of, and he goes, and, and, very brilliant. and then he says, after saying, you know, the thorough way to analyze any personality model is, is by exactly in the system because then you know it's objective, it's clear, it's an absolute, it's a truth. All of these five, what do they call them? The spectrums are absolutely different from each other. And then he holds up Maya's Greeks to that and smashes it to pieces. He turns the light out under it. Because the reason he turns the light out for Maya's Briggs is because what he says is the only way to understand personality is through this X, Y, and Z assumption. And then he holds up Maya's Briggs to that paradigm and it collapses underneath that. And then he says, that's dead. Let's move on. There's a video where he literally kind of goes, that's dead, let's move on. And I thought that was a fascinating statement because it's incredibly compelling from a very brilliant guy. But it also makes me wonder because there's so much value in Maz Briggs. Now, I'm not into any of these systems, but I find them all curios a curiosity. And I'm very interested in what Torah has to say on the subject, but that's another course of discussion, etc. What interests me is what I saw he did is he turned the lights out on my Briggs. Most normal people, even intelligent, clear thinking people, will laugh at my Briggs in future and they will never think twice about using it in any way because he turned the lights out on it. And the way you turn the lights out on something, according to this marketing guy, is if anything you want to bring up at all, according to some paradigms that thing may be good but according to some paradigms that may thing may be bad if i bring up something according to my paradigm and i show you how empty it is according to my paradigm then it turns the lights out on it for you and based on the limitations of human consciousness you'll never you basically won't be able to say you could and you should well, but under another paradigm, perhaps that offers something more. Because once the light is out on it, you rarely choose to go back into that place and turn the light back on. Do you know everything about Myers Briggs? Have you done a thousand studies on the Big Five and a thousand studies on Myers Briggs in your personal testing and find that there's some things that the Big Five what reveals that, that Myers Briggs doesn't. Have you found that there's some things Myers Briggs brings out that the other one doesn't? Yeah, but it was never created under a scientific methodology. Are you at the point in your life when you say only things created under scientific me me methodology are only accurate and true forever? Science has ever got anything wrong in all of its history? It never made a mistake, even with its brilliance and genius. We're not saying it doesn't have a contribution, but do other methodologies of thinking, including intuition, not ever have a contribution either? So when you hold up system A under paradigm B, then it squashes A. But if I would hold it up under another paradigm, perhaps it would blossom. So the marketing methodology of this very talented individual was, you work out what you think is the most important thing to say about what you contribute. And then you bring everything else up and you turn the lights out on it based on that paradigm. And therefore the audience will no longer look to the competition, but they'll only see you. And it's true. And it's true because you are better and elevated through that comparison. But what was that comparison? The comparison was the capacity of human consciousness that I can make you turn your lights out. 
I can make you make your mind turn the lights out for other things that it's looking at. Do you ever wonder what it takes for a person to have a knife in their hand to go to a Hanukkah party with a bunch of Jewish religious people and start stabbing men and women and children with a knife? Only a week ago, there was a terrible shooting somewhere in New Jersey area. I don't know if you saw this devastating video. It wasn't, there was a video of the shooting. There was a devastating video of the night after the shooting and a bunch of people standing on the street corner. And non-Jews who are living there standing on the street corner, there's a guy with a video camera just filming them talking and they're sitting there going, Oh, did one of your Jewish friends get killed? Good, I'm glad. I hope they kill more next time. And a whole group of people, not one idiot, not two idiots, but a whole group of people saying, yeah, kill all the Jews, kill them all, hope they get more next time. And everyone cheering that on. Where does that perception come from? Now I'm not talking Kabbalistically. I'm not talking about anti-Semitism from a Kabbalistic perspective, an energetic perspective, but global conscious issue, I'm just talking about the basis of racism that is very, very possible to get a person to turn the lights out in a whole group of people. If you say enough bad things, if you frame it according to a certain paradigm, then most human beings will turn their lights out on many individuals. They will turn their lights out on organizations, on any kind of leader. I mean, this thing about Trump, you love Trump, he's the savior, he's the Mashiach Mamish, or he's the devil Mamish. There's absolutely no option in between. <laughs> Where does such insane polarization come from? He is psychologically sick. He has done a lot of good things to the Jewish people. Rarely do you hear someone acknowledge both of those paradigms together. Why, why is that hard to do? Okay. The answer is because we turn our lights on, or most of the time we turn our lights off. And when our lights are off, then people can very easily turn the lights off in everything we look at and everything perceive. I want to show you something very, very interesting, psychologically, energetically. And this is, of course, the essence of Hanukkah. Because Hanukkah is how we survive in a world where the whole world is in exile. It's the final yonta, the final festival as we go into the free fall of, of 2,000 years of exile. And it's the final festival of, of what happens of when, when the whole world is collapsing into darkness. When no one will perceive spiritual truth, well, no one will see holiness, well, no one will see that which is the source of the light. And everything is a world of argument and ego and fragmentation of, because we're just seeing reflected light and interpreted light and we don't know how to see the source anymore. And, and the goal of us, because remember, our sages fixed up this yonta, fixed up this festival because they said, this is the energetic power you will need to survive the ultimate darkness. And that is the ability to light a candle in the darkness. You see, Purim is the energy of an Ahapachu, that all the darkness itself turns to light and was revealed to be the light the whole time. But Hanukkah is even amidst the darkness, when you're still in the darkness, how do you light a candle? How do you learn to see in the dark? Purim is, is the light of the sun. When the light, sun shines in the sky, everything is light. Hanukkah is, is the light of the moon. The light of the moon brings light into the darkness. It shines light as the darkness. So Purim has the ability to, to reveal that everything was only light. But Hanukkah is how do we turn on the light when the lights have been turned out? And the answer is by lighting a candle. Ne'er Hashem Nishmas Adam. That Ne'er Hashem, the candle of, of Hashem is the soul of us, is our soul. And if you can turn on your soul, if you can illuminate your higher consciousness and live with that higher consciousness and therefore perceive the world with that higher consciousness and therefore act with that consciousness, 
then you start turning the light back on with all things. When you live in a way that is illuminated, you start to, to illuminate others and illuminate things and draw the goodness out of those things. Chachmas Adam Te'ir Panav. The Chachman, the Sefer Shebechol Devar, as Rabbi Nachman says, when you access the light, then you can see the divinity within all things. How do we access the light? This is what is said in the Kitveyori, that the Hebrew word for ne'er, the candle, this is a little Kabbalistic and a little weird, but you'll go with the flow with me for a second. There's three parts of our consciousness. There's the supernatural part of our being, the Ketu and the Chachma, full of true light, and that is turned off, meaning we're disconnected from it, we don't know how to illuminate it. The candle is extinguished. We are born and our candle is extinguished. The potential for light is there, of infinite light is there. But through the path of the sinners, the path of the Vekas, we need to turn on that candle to turn on that illumination. And that's one, and that's called Ekiah. And then there's the, 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 the consciousness of, of mind and emotion, of heart, which is called Elohim, the, the, the division and the plurality, the, the divisiveness sometimes of the heart, but it's also a much more dynamic place of dynamic forces that can be harnessed to work together, and that's called Elohim. That's where our power is, the energy is, the force is within us. And then there is a full physical body and our full physical actions how we physically interact with the world, and that's called Adonai, Adonis. And what we have to do to become fully once again awakened, fully once again illuminated in a dark world, to become a candle in a dark world, is we have to bring the ultimate divine energy into that higher world of what's called Ekia, then bring that ultimate divine energy into the heart, which is called Elohim, and bring that ultimate divine energy into the body and into our actions, which is called Adonai. Now, if you like to follow the Kabbalah, if you don't, just tune out for the next 30 seconds and come back. We'll be here, the same people, it's okay. So if you take Hashem's name, Be'etzim, the Atmos, it's Yud and He and Vav and He. And if you combine that with Ekia, then that's you bringing divinity down into your soul to you light the candle. But the candle's not fully lit because it has to be fully embodied. Your, your soul is fully lit when it is fully embodied. But now we have to bring that into our heart and the passion that we're feeling that light, we're feeling that energy, we're feeling that divinity, we're feeling our true self. So I bring the Yud and He and Havav He and I align that, I do a Shilav, remember we learned about a Shilav, I combine that with my emotions, with my mind, with my consciousness, and I get Yud and He and Vav He now together with Elohim. And then it's not enough to know it with your consciousness, not enough to know it in your heart. Now you have to assume a Nisi, you have to shine that out into the world through how you perceive others and the actions you choose to interact with others and interact with the physicality, interact with the world. So I bring the Yud and He and Vav and He down into Adnus, now into my manifestation, down into my revelation, down into my body that's the source of all physical healing, then down into my actions. If you take the numerical value of Yud and He and Vav He and Ekiah and Yud and He and Vav He and Elohim and Yudin He and Vav He and Adnus, then that adds up to Ne'er. That adds up to Candle. That's the Ne'er Chanukah. It's very, very interesting. The holy teachings of our tradition say that Chanukah is numerical value. Dam Adam. The blood of the person. It's actually also numerical value of, of Guf. Of the body. The Ne'er Chanukah, you have to take the illumination of the light and bring it down into the most embodied place. And then you have the Sumenisa, then you can shine that light into the world. The line you will shine depends entirely on, on the light that you perceive. What it means to be Kadash, what it means to be holy, is exactly what the candle candles teach us. There are eight candles and there's the Shamash, right? The Shamash represents Chachma, the eight candles represent the seven spheres and the, the world of Bina, and the higher light, the divine soul, 
has to come down to our intellect, Bina, and illuminate our clarity and our perception. And then through illuminating our clarity and perception, then it can come down to chesed, to our capacity to love, and, and guru, our capacity to fear, and to feris, our capacity for harmony, and all the way down all the spirit until my whole being in Malchus is fully illuminated. And that's what I'm doing each day. So it's Hanukkah, which we're transitioning into tonight is the final illumination, Zois Chanukah, which is the holiest day where all the energy of all of Chanukah is fully embodied, fully present, fully manifest, fully revealed. Zois means, Zois Ani Beteach, Zois means the Shekhinah, means the revelation. Zois, Zeh Hashem I can point to Hashem, I can point to the Vinayak, it's tangible, it's real. It's not just Hashem is up in the, in the clouds, you know, it's, it's like here is an action, a revelation of consciousness, of, of true perception of reality in the most beautiful, profound way. I see the light, I, I feel the Kedusha. Zois means ma the manifestation. When my, my, my higher light is illuminated, my, my chokhma, my light, my chalik of Hashem is turned on fully, and then it clarifies my perception through my understanding of Vina, and then it comes down and informs my full emotional capacity, and they all channel together into the guf, into the adam, adam, into the blood, into the most physical part of my being, and then it's expressed. That is called the ner of Hanukkah. Ner of Hanukkah, the letters together, Kabbalistically embody that the full illumination of your being should flood your entire consciousness and manifest even in the most physical sense. And that is only achieved when you can learn to see light for what it truly is rather than what you need from it. When you're able to see the light for what it truly is rather than what you need from it. I don't want to get controversial, but you know. Given what I do and you see the, the incredible proliferation today of... of consciousness and development and mindfulness and emotional intelligence work and and trauma therapy and you know the incredible research that's being done around the world in these things is textbook 100 percent word for word what was described by the ramcha by the vilna Gaon, by the Baal by the riyaka dash by the by the 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 zohar mamish 2000 years ago that this is exactly what would be revealed in our generation the vilna Gaon says that there are seven signs that we're close to Mashiach, and one of the seven signs is called Hit al that people will be able to rapidly attack in their midas and transform their consciousness on, on, in an in a unprecedented way, faster and deeper than any generation. And as we've learned together, the Zohar says this will come through a combination of the revelation of Kabbalah and mystical teachings together with science, the higher world and lower world, and then coming together and forming and guiding each other will create this final revolution of consciousness. But, my friends, as we are still in early days of this process, one of the things you see is that even tools of meditation themselves are used to fulfill ego goals. <clears throat> and you know, I have to say as an educator, great. <laughs> great. You know, I teach my kids how to meditate from very, very young. And they do really wonderful things. But there's an age they all get to when they're not so interested in it anymore. So I bribe them with money. <laughs> and it's totally a win-win situation. Because now they feel like uh, they're tricking Tati and they're getting lots of money. And I'm like, yeah, you keep tri tricking me, right? And they have incredible spiritual experiences and they, they do incredible emotional transformation work and, and they do it every night and they love it and they actually love doing it. So that it's just kind of, you know, the money's pushing towards that point. But there's an idea that sometimes, and this is warned about in Kabbalah, and this is warned about in Kusudas, is that I want to learn about consciousness, I want to learn about mindfulness, I want to learn about the life because I want to be more successful at work because I want to get over that block so I can feel I can get more money, that I can achieve more goals, I just don't want to hate myself. And that's fine, that's fine. Hashem is also tricking you to getting you on the spiritual bandwagon. But there's another way that people are willing to for their own ego self. You know, I've, I've mentioned many, many times before that in a circle, the Dalai Lama are quite upset with what the Dalai Lama did by releasing mindfulness to the Western world because they think that he sold out the Dharma and they see they sold out the Buddhist, the core Buddhist teachings. You know, there's a thing called uh, today in America that the, the, the mindful sniper and in the U.S. Army, there's a thing called the mindful sniper that they, they teach snipers how to use mindfulness to kill people more, more better. Now, you could say that's awesome. Because if you believe 
the army is doing good work in the world, and you believe that, then why shouldn't everyone be more conscious and more masked of that inner ability to be more successful? Basically, and that's a wonderful thing. But you can also see how that kinds to cross a, a, a kind of a line. That today spirituality can be used and is frequently used in looking at some of the quote unquote competitors. It's such a stupid term to call it, but you know, there's there's one organization you know where they're teaching mindfulness and energy healing and spirituality and the guru behind it's not even a guru i don't know who he is an entrepreneur he's kind of like you know why can't mindfulness be sexy and why can't it? that's literally his word and, and he definitely does that's on the side and that's why i'm not going back to that side again but uh it's, it's this whole thing of you know the law of attraction as Ruby nachman says is a reality the zohar says it very very clearly it works but the law of attraction is do you want a spiritual power you want access to the light Think how much money you can make. Think of that pretty girl you can get. Think of the ultimate house, the ultimate car, the ultimate looks, the ultimate lifestyle. So sometimes when people reach for the light itself, they only want it for themselves. They only want the light for that personal ego usage. That's very, very problematic. It's highly, highly destructive. But it's the most insidious form of destruction because it creates the illusion that you're growing and evolving and doing something noble. What you're doing is you're taking the light for yourself. When you take the light for yourself, you're blinded to the light because you're not seeing it as the source. You're seeing it refracted and reflected and distorted through your own needs. So it's one thing to do that in the world of money, the world of sexuality, in the world of desire, in the world of ego, in the world of commercialism, materialism. It's one thing to, to see the physicality and not see the spirituality, but it's much, much more destructive. And this is, thank God, this is a very high level of challenge. Our generation is is, is so to be facing this challenge that the more tools come out of spiritual development and they're revealed from higher sources of light themselves, of higher, deeper meaning, when we take those things, we take those spiritual energy and we use them for our own ego needs. then it's very, very dangerous. And if you understand that, you can rewind a little and understand why we don't use the light of Kanaka. Because the idea of something holy is there's something that has to exist for itself. And this is the last thing I want to explain along the language of explanation, along the path of explanation. Before we step a little together into the path of experience. The tachlis achayim, the purpose of life itself. <laughs> is that all of reality is split into two. Or the kalim, light and vessels. And the perfection of the world, what we call tikkun oilam, is the vessel, vessels should be singularly dedicated to revealing the light. When a vessel is so dedicated to revealing the light, there becomes no distinction anymore between light or vessel. They become one unified entity. There's a lot of innovative models today about how companies, organizations should be managed. The old school is there's a CEO, CEO, and there's the kind of C group at the top, and they they tell what everyone else to do. The kind of dominating tyranny kind of an organization. There's all these kind of new fascinating models that you see more and more. I don't know all the fancy terminology for them. Has anyone read any of these books? There's this thing about the system out of colors, um, but this idea that that you can create autonomous cells within a company where they are free and empowered to make their own decisions. And there's no longer kind of top-down hierarchy, but there's a kind of more organic model where everybody works together and makes decisions within a cell and the way that it forms other cells. And there's all these like incredible, anyone who ever read books about this? There's a famous, it's a, called Teal. You can look this up. It's kind of like Teal Management System. It's a very fascinating model. And, and this is a very deep idea in Kabbalah that, that systems, organisms, what's called in Kabbalah, a parts of a system doesn't just only work from the top down. In its refined state, the vessel and the light become organically one and the same. 
at the beginning stage of that, it's getting a little ahead of the game to discuss that, is that everything in your system needs to be dedicated and rededicated to the language of Hanukkah, to the light. And all Tikkun Amidus, all emotional healing, all emotional brokenness and all emotional healing is always exactly the same thing. It's like I have a self-sabotaging part of me. What is that self-sabotaging part? What is self-sabotaging? It means my fear. It means my lust. It means my ego. It's self-sabotaging. I keep getting into relationships. I keep trying to make them work. And suddenly I know I, I become passive aggressive. And sometimes I retreat. I want to be loved so much, but I'm so afraid of rejection. I retreat. So I'm trying to be in a relationship with love. I've been praying to love and finding the perfect person. I finally met the perfect person. And, and, and what am I doing? I'm acting in a way that's blowing up the relationship. Why is that? Why is that? This is everybody's fundamental issue, which is the self-sabotaging nature, which means if I'm a dual being, that my lower self is not just distinct from my higher self, but it will act in opposition to the primary will of the being, of the primary will of the organization. And Tikkun Amidus means that I realign the vessels to be aligned, to be calibrated, to fully revealing and manifesting the light. I've said this many times before, everyone said by Tikkun Oilam, and we hear in America a lot from all different sources, Tikkun Oilam, Jews into Tikkun Oilam, and what does that mean? It means planting trees in Israel or something, I don't know what it means, Tikkun Oilam. Tikkun Oilam means if you want to know what Tikkun, to fix the world. If you want to really know what to fix the world is, I'll say it very fast, I've said it many times before, the essence of the, what is really needs to be fixing in the world the world means oilam. Oilam comes from the root nelem, which means hidden. The essence of the world is a place of hiddenness. What's hidden in the world? Hashem, divinity, revelation. So the essence of Tikkun Oilam literally translates as to fix the hiddenness, to fix the concealment. So if Hashem is hidden in the world, then we have to turn the light on, turn the candle on within our consciousness and within the world. So does plant, try, I'm not saying planting trees is not a good and important thing in Israel or anywhere in the world. Of course it is. Of course we have to preserve the environment. But that does not fix the world in of itself because it doesn't fix the core issue of what broke the world and we can, we can replant all the trees in the Amazon and we can clean all the rivers and it won't help the world. What do you mean it won't help the world? Because we'll destroy it again in five seconds. Because the problem is systemic. It's a problem of consciousness. That if you see the world is only there to be used for your desire, that means that for number one, you know that person's consciousness has turned out, their candle has turned off. And therefore, when they look at the river, when they look at the trees, when they look at nature, all they see is the externality. They don't see a divine piece of, you know, spark of light that, that is there with a divine purpose and a revelation that needs to be nurtured and cared for and protected. But you don't see that at all. It's the light is turned out. What's nature? We can, we can, you know, we're trying to make $100 billion. My focus is $100 billion. My paradigm is the first coming to make $100 billion. So what is a river then? Oh, I can turn the lights out on a river. I can turn the lights out on a forest. You understand how people see this thing. So we can replant all these things, but I'm still looking at the world. My, my lights are out, so it's, I turn the lights off of the world. Therefore, tick and oil literally means to turn back on, to fix the hiddenness, to fix the consumer by revealing divinity, divine revelation. But we say, as, as the Zohar says, and many sages say, just like the world is an oilum god, or a human being is an oilum cotton, a human being is a small world. That means I'm not just a small world, a small universe, an oilum cotton, I'm a small hiddenness. That means I have within me incredible divinity. And I have in me self-sabotaging parts which resist and push out my divinity. And if you understand what we're saying, my friends, the chinuch, the inauguration, the hischadshus, the renewal of the self, the renewal of the consciousness, must be when the vessel is realigned. That means my ego, my desire, is acting individually out of alignment of being dedicated to expressing my higher self. And tikkun amidus doesn't mean to break bad habits. It doesn't mean to heal yourself of trauma, though those things are necessary on part of the journey. 
It means to take all the primary forces in your consciousness, called the midat, which are, which are sabotaging the primary mission, and realign them, recalibrate them, that they themselves should be vessels. That means your pride should be invested in the ultimate success of your divine mission in the world. It means your desire should not be, I want to, you know, desire to help the world in the best way, but I'm going to take a little money to the side and blow up the organization because of that. That means my desire is compromising my primary mission. So what I'm trying to get is my desires would feel the ultimate pleasure by helping the most people. If I have a primary soul motivation, which is kindness and increase the world of kindness, then I want to train and condition and educate that, that my emotions themselves would get the most pleasure, not from stealing, but from contributing. So the actual idea of, of the, the, the preparation, the integration, the initiation of desires the education, that you understand the word Hanukkah literally means to initiate, to renew, to, to, to educate the darkness, the resistance, to now become a vessel to receive the light. And that's what it means that I have to turn the candle on in my own consciousness. Hanukkah is always bringing about the light into the darkness. It's not a festival about going into the light itself. It's about can you turn on the illumination in the gullus, in the exile, in the desire. That's what you see wherever we do a, a, any of them part of the mitzvah of Hanukkah. It's always on the interface between light and darkness. The time that we light the candles of Hanukkah is at the end of the day when we move into, into the night. So it's about bringing that light down in, right? You light the candles in your doorway. The doorway of the house is the, the interface in Kabbalah between the Rishos Yachid and the Rishus Rabin, which is, you know, from the, the safety and security of the inner protected world of the street, which represents the Chabad, into the world of the Midas, the crazy chaos of the external world, right? We, we, we light on the left side of the door. The left side of the door is the side of Gevura. Left is Gevura, which is the negative forces in the world. So we bring the menorah over to the left side. The, the, the Hanukkah was actually beginning, the, the Hanukkah festival was really, the, the whole energy and the whole miracle that happened was at the end of the prophetic era, in the transition to the, the external, the exile era and the intellectual era of the Gemara. So at that transition between higher and lower, moving into darkness, that's where we bring the light in. That's where we light that light. As we enter into darkness, we enter into the refracted light rather than the source light. As we enter from higher consciousness into our mirrors, then we have to train ourselves, don't use meditation for ego reasons. See meditation as a source of light itself. And if you have ego, then bring your ego up to the light itself. Don't define your life by saying, I'm going to make this amount of money and this kind of house and this kind of looks and this kind of lifestyle. And then say, and on the side, I want to meditate and practice. Because that will help me feel spiritual as I do the other things. Inverse that model. Who am I? What is my essence? What is my primary light? And then structure your life around that. As we always say, don't fit, don't fit elevation into your life. Fit your life into elevation. That's, you know, that's exactly that same model. You have to lead from the light. And to lead from the light, the light can't serve you. You serve the light. <laughs> that's the idea of Mr. Nefesh, of Mayim uh, Nukvin, all these ideas in Kabbalah of, of, of the sacrifice necessary of Hanukkah. You have to step into the light. You have to step into the light. That's the secret, the essence of Hanukkah. So the idea of, of not to use the lights is the way we confront our darkness, the way we confront our fear. When I'm working with people one-on-one, -on -one, you see me doing in seminars and treats many, many times. A person's overwhelmed with fear and down. It could be haunting their lives for much decades. The first thing you do is give them to Vegas. The first gift you give is, is move them up into the higher self. Give them the ultimate gift. And when they see that, then everything else is, is solely malleable. It's, it's there. It can be reframed. It can be interpreted. It can be literally released in a moment from, from that greater light, from that greater perspective. If you try and heal or break, or, you know, what did your mother do when you're four years old and you strike that first, it's a long haul. It's a challenge. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes other blocks get in the way. It doesn't mean it can't be done. But when you reach for the light first and you transcend everything else and go, first you transcend, right? And then you can come back and integrate everything into that. So Hanukkah is about 
the <laughs> renewal self by the refocus on the light, the refocus of the source. Mm -hmm. And then the realignment of the lower world, of the world of dark and the world of to come into that. And when you see the world from that place of light, then you can turn the light on within yourself. You can actually, one of the most powerful ways, as we've learned many times before from the Baoism talk, the most powerful way to transform your destructive emotions is to identify the divinity within them, even in that fear, even in that doubt, even in that trauma, that itself is transformative. You turn that, you don't say, most people, they're, they're dealing with fears for 50 years because their fear is the most awful, awful, terrible thing. I have fear with them. It's the most terrible thing. And every time it comes up, rather than heal it and transform it, they push it back down because they've turned the light off within the fear. The Belgium says, so no, turn the candle back on within the fear. Fear is part of divinity. It's part of your divine nature. It was used as a protective mechanism to protect you when you were young. That's why it was there. It wasn't it doing its purpose. Wasn't doing it. When you start seeing the good, that itself is radically transformational. And then you're willing to accept it, to receive it, to open it. You, you turn the light back on your mirrors and when your your heart is fully open and hardly fully uh, illuminated and lit if you will then you go back into the world and you see other people's strain and other people's struggles and other people's challenges you're not repulsed by that fear or degrade them because their fear you want to turn the light on within them with individuals with nations within people when you are illuminated you can illuminate the world when your darkness is within your candle is off you will turn the light out in everything questions <laughs> Yes. There are people that I see that, that have miraculous healing through energetic work or consciousness work. And then they go back to their lives and all the same problems that got them sick in the first place. That's a challenge. It's a challenge because they're gonna be sick again and this time it's gonna be worse. Because they don't know how to step out of the paradigm. If my ego runs my life and I can turn to spirituality as a way to heal the illness the ego created and now I'm back and healthy again, and go straight back to work at how it was before. That's a problem. There's a flip side that a person who doesn't realize that the psychologically destructive life they've led has caused the illness that they suffer with. And now, through realizing I have no choice, they can step into a new way of seeing themselves, a new way of being, a new way of understanding the shame and reality use that light, use that truva to heal themselves. And, and, and then the, the sickness itself was a, a launch pad into a life of deeper integration, deeper acceptance. And that of course is a wonderful thing. So the question is to be real with which one are you using this for? Wherever we are up to, especially the lesson of Hanukkah, Hashem is willing to come down and help us. The question is, are we being real with the blessing? Are we being real? Are we there to serve the light or is the light there to serve us? Are we there to serve Hashem? Is Hashem there to serve me? Do I turn to Hashem with something I want in my terms, then I push off that relationship? If you do that with Hashem, I promise you, you do that with people too. I promise you do that with your spouse too. When you use everyone and you're nice to everyone and compassionate to everyone with something you need from them, and when you don't need anything, so you don't see source lights. So you don't look in your spouse's eyes and see the infinite light. You see, I love them, they're beautiful, and she's fantastic when she's fulfilling my personal need. When we do that with others, they're doing that with Hashem as well. Everything I see about, when people ask me about the relationship with Hashem, you can tell them everything about they need to know about Hashem, just seeing what they're doing in their lives, and the inverse as well. The way you live is the way you pray, the way the pray is the way you live as we say in the program. So absolutely, you can and should use it the light and the blessing and these teachings, these tools for healing. But we want to expand our consciousness a little bit to be aware of, am I seeing the sickness as a way to, to re-enter the light? Or am I seeing the light as an opportunity to get back on my feet to pursue my own life sickness? And I guess that's the challenge. Does that answer your question? Wonderful. Questions? Yes, sir? Um, it's 
seeing the light as a way to heal. And my question is, on a daily basis, can we change that like desire to like, meditate or find Hashem or whatever as a means to heal myself? As instead, and like, can I change that into like just wanting the light and doing whatever He makes? So it's a, very, it's a very important question. It's also a very high level question. Most people aren't up to that question yet. Like they're dealing with trauma and they just want the pain to go away, right? Or that they're trying to be productive and their mind is just full of such noise. And they, they don't have the luxury to, to ask such beautiful questions and deeper vote out. Do you know what I mean? So I'm just I'm acknowledging everyone's own level. I, I think it's just a sensitivity. You know, the first time someone has a massive cosmic spiritual experience, it has different effects for different people. You know, like I, I'm joking about ayahuasca, it's a very positive thing today. There's some people that go on ayahuasca and they just go, I've met people that have become fun because that LSD experience has opened them up. And they've met other people who've just gone lost in the ayahuasca LSD reality because, you know, you know, because mother ayahuasca knows what's best for me. And my mission now is to give ayahuasca to everyone in the world because that's the only way to heal the world. Because that's the only way to heal me. As if I am now healed because of my one ayahuasca experience. So th therefore, you see the, the the challenge in consciousness. Any gift up is also a potential risk. If you know, it's a well-known, documented fact that if a person wins a lot on a hundred billion dollars, you know, they can their divorce rate goes up and all challenges go up. They've lost that within a few years because any influx of blessing has zelu mazer risk of positive or negative, and therefore the gift of healing, the gift of light can be a wonderful gift to some people and it can destroy people's lives or get them addicted, addicted to whatever got them in the first place. So in more direct answer to your question, you're a, a sensitive seeking soul in general and, and the more you experience the light, the more you realize uh, the light meaning is Shem and then the deeper truth of reality, the more you realize that it may have a different mission for our lives and our journey than, than our ego self has. And, and the, the, the journey of true expansion and true revelation and true deep and profound healing is always one of his pathless, of, of humility, a path of deep humility, a path of, of, of deeply willing to question fundamental elements about myself and my truth. And when one proceeds with another, then, then the deepest heights are attainable. When one takes the light and reflects it through their ego, then they think they're seeing the light, but what they're seeing is an ultimate darkness. And Hashem should help. That, that's why there's so many, I don't want to go into this, but uh, things I end up saying in class. Um, that's why there's lots of gurus that go dark. And even, even like rabbis that go dark. And rabbis that integrate well and go dark. Is, 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 it's not because they're con artists and there's no spirituality. It's because they have a lot of spirituality. But when the spirituality comes in, that they don't see the light for itself. That I can't use this light for anything. I can't reflect it through my, all my needs and my desires. That I turn myself to the light. And, and, and that feeling that many, many people experience is discussed in this realm. When you have your spiritual experience, wow, I'm healed now. Wow. I'm, I'm, all these people walk around, I have intuition. I'm gonna, this is, I know the... There's people that come up to me all the time and I'm going, wow, I have intuition, Rabbi, I'm going to tell you all about this. And you're just like, oh my gosh, the person is so deluded. The fact that it doesn't turn out at all like what they said, but it's a very cool thing. Everyone's into intuition book fetish today. And I know I teach this stuff, but the more I teach it, the more I'm like, I'm, you shouldn't really be teaching this. Because nine out of ten people you know, are, are seeing the reflective light and not really seeing the source. So that idea when you get that spiritual experience, oh, I'm healed, oh, I'm holy, oh, I'm chosen, oh, I've broken through, oh, I'm... And that's and the bigger the people are, the bigger, you know, the longer the beards and the more Torah they know, and the harder they've worked, then the, the more dangerous it is. And this is discussed in Kabbalah, by the way. That's why you have to have a shtavis before you learn Kabbalah. E equanimity, which means I'm, I'm not positively and negatively affected. Someone says, I love you, it doesn't bother me. Someone says, I hate you, it also doesn't bother me. Because that's what you need to hold your consciousness when the influx starts. And the second you go, wow, I had a spiritual experience, you're dead. You're worse than dead. You're alive in, in the dark side. And that's because we don't, we're afraid, we don't know how, we don't have the humility to see the light for itself. Oh, I can't be bothered turning the light, I just want to read my book in front of the menorah. No, listen one more time. Close your book, turn on the light. Don't use this for anything. When you learn, if desire destroys your capacity to perceive the truth, the more desire you have, the more need you have 
the more you can't see objective reality for what it is. I've told you many times before, when I first started teaching people, one of my favorite rabbis said, I said, what's the best way to help people really? He says, when someone sits down in front of you and has a question for you, in your head you say, there's nothing at all I need from this person. I don't need their approval. I don't need their validation. I don't need them to think I'm smart. Or I've worked with this. There's nothing at all. When you fix that in your head and you get that into your heart, then not only will you help them, or well, you certainly won't hinder them, but the miracle it is that suddenly you see unbelievable things that they need to know. Because when you don't have any need or use from them, you are now in a place of holiness because you've transcended, I want that person to approve me, to love me, to invest in me, to give to donate to me, right? So you've cleansed yourself out. You now move into illumination. And then suddenly you look at that person and you can illuminate them. And, and they can say, how did you know that? And you're like, I, I really don't know because I, I don't. And then I guess that because the light is coming with them because, because if desire destroys your capacity to perceive the truth, the more desire you have, the more blinded you are. And the more that you just see the candles for themselves and you can't use them, then the light comes back in the world. All of exile and all of destruction reality is because we interact with the reality and others from our own ego needs. And that is the definition of exile. That's how we lost the temple in the first place. Because we were offering, this is another way he says, we're offering sacrifices, but our heart wasn't in it. Our heart was in our own egos, our own thing. We're offering sacrifices. We're doing all the holy service in the temple. But all the Kohanim are like, I'm the most important Kohanim. You're the most important You're not the most important Kohanim. I'm turning the lights on all the Kohanim. I'm turning the lights on. My, I've got the best Kohanim. And you're, my Kohanim's bigger than your Kohanim. My car's bigger than your car. Not much has changed. My iPhone's newer than your iPhone. Right? Not much has changed. I'm a better mindfulness meditator than you are. Right? And, and it's, it's all, we're all still in the same thing, comparing one to the other. And not an idea that the Vilna Gaon said is one of the seven things to bring the Sheikh is that we, his shtav, as he defines his shtav, as there is we will see everybody else as equal to us. And we'll no longer see that one is more uh, bigger than the other. That is one of the things that will move us into the final human, you know, evolution of human consciousness into the times of the Sheikh. So this is also the core idea that, that, that I see you for who you truly are rather than what I need from you. And therefore, I, I'm an illuminated consciousness and I, I see the truth and light within you. And that's, that's the light of Hanukkah. That's the re-inauguration of ourselves. That's the re-education of Hanukkah is of ourselves to learn to see the light again only when I'm Kaddish, only when I'm separated, only when I'm transcendent state. And then I can turn the light back onto others. It's amazing in life how many people we turn the light out on. You can meet with couples that come. I, I know I'm, I'm sad to say, I see my own self, my own marriage. There's periods of your life when you turn your light out the light on on your spouse. Ah, oh, she's just, you know, depressed. It's not my responsibility. She's just, you know, he's just, you know, full of himself. You know, he actually has needs. No, no, he's just full of himself, you know. All the things people do, that they spend weeks not talking to each other, and somebody she's not, and they're like, yeah, I'm giving up on them. What do you mean you're giving up? You just turn the light on. Part of the reason we turn lights on people is because then we don't have to be bothered taking responsibility for them. There's people in the community, all these people that start, you know, all the chassinim are all, the second you start with all the cinema, all, all the blacks are all, all the Asians are all, all the, all the Litvish people, they're all, you know, it's just like, who speaks like that? The answer is everyone, but besides that, right? So it's, it's this way that we turn lights out, we turn the light out on things. And I promise you, anyone that dismisses any group of people, any individual, I promise you they're doing that in their own self to themselves. Because if their consciousness was in a more expanded state, they would integrate all of their being into the light, the Chachma, to the Bina, to the Seven, all eight, the Shamash. The Shamash means also, um, Shamash means um, to serve. So it's very interesting because the Shamash, here's a beautiful story, you ready? I'll tell you the source of the story after. The Shamash, what does Shamash literally mean? To use, and also means to use, it, it, it serves. Like, uh, like Shemash Tamad Chacham, to serve another. So there's eight candles, which are the seven mitters, all the emotions of the heart, and the intellect, the bina. And then the shamash is the one that illuminates the others. This is very deep to Are you ready? The shamash is called shamash because chachma is, is complete people. Chachma, the state of consciousness, when you're in that supernatural state of consciousness, when you blow out of your body, you have no sense of self, right? You've released yourself, and your whole being is nullified to the infinite oneness of reality and the shame and everything. So that, that, that self, the part of consci consciousness called shamash, is doing shimush, it's basically nullified to receive from a higher source. So that ability of to see another, when someone's coming in front of you, as a rabbi, they're going to ask for help. There's a million things you want as a rabbi. You, want, you may want a donation. You may want their approval. They have to think you're cool and insightful intelligent. You can't be of service. You're not seeing them. 
you can't help them. You can't see anything outside of yourself. You're just seeing the reflected light of yourself until you 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 become a shamish. You become you do shimish. You 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 turn to the chachm. You turn to the highest state. And, and then you nullify yourself. That means the vessel is no longer Anna Emlach, that I want to rule, the ego says, I want to rule, the, the desire says, I want to rule, and the lust says, I want to rule, and the fear says, I want to rule, and my trauma says, I want to rule. No, 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 no. They all turn around and be channeled, be harnessed, be calibrated to receive from the infinite light of my soul. And that's why I have incredible insights into them suddenly, or beautiful things to help them, because my whole being is aligned to receive from Hashem, not to be filled with my own consciousness, my own noise, my own chaos, my own trauma, my own pain, my own doubt, my own confusion, etc. So the idea of Shemesh is very beautiful because the being and the intellect thinks it knows everything about everything all the time and my fear, my ego think it knows it, oh look, I, he's also going to betray me. Oh look, I can, I can fulfill my desires with them. It's projecting and vomiting myself into the world. Therefore, there's no cleat, there's no vessel, there's no space to receive from higher revelation. So the only light is Chochmah, which is always pure. That's the Pach Shemen. The Pach Shemen is the part that's always Kaddish. It was always untouched. It's, it, it, right? it, there's a part of you, even everything is... is Contaminated, there's part of your conscious call, that's the Chelek of Akami Ma'al, the Neshama that's always untouched, it's always pure, it's always holy. And when it's in that place, it, 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 it's doing Shemesh to Hashem. It's doing Shemesh to a Talmud Chochem. A Chochem means Chochma, means the Vekas. And it's that light of Bittal, that night of nullification, that light of humility, which I illuminate my Bina. I bring humility to the Bina, to my intellect. I bring humility to the kindness, to, to my desires for pleasure. I bring mean, humility to my fear. So my fear can say, tell me something about, I should be afraid of not hurting people. Not, not, I should be afraid of, of not respecting people fully rather than afraid of being rejected by people. And, 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 I, and I bring the light of the, the radiant light of, of illumination, but also humility. To be, to be fully aware of a higher truth, a higher goodness, a higher light, and they bring that down to all the levels, and that illuminates each one. And therefore, that's called the shamash because it's really kadash. The, the, the shamash is really that which is kadash. And I use that's chokhmah. Chokhmah is, is, the, is the ninth one. And I use that to illuminate all the others. So there's a little bit of humility and light within my intellect. There's a little bit of humility and light within my, within my desire for pleasure, a little bit of humility and light within my desire for fear. That's why Maccabee, you heard of Maccabee. Maccabee is Rosh Hashanah, Mi Kamoicha Ve'ilim Hashem. Interesting. Maccabee is Rosh Hashanah, Mi Kamoicha Ve'ilim Hashem. Who is like you? How do you usually translate the term Mi Kamoicha Ve'ilim Hashem? What's Pshat? How, how would you usually translate it? And mighty, powerful. What's that? Among the powers. Among the powers. Who are the powers? So often that's the all the other forces in the world. Sometimes there's a source of a vote or all the negative forces. Though, who 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 is like you compared to all the other gods that people worship? All those kind of things. Right? All the powers and forces in the world. So a very beautiful Yehuda Maccabee. It means Yehuda will become a Maccabee. What does it mean, Yehuda? Yehuda is Yehudim, Jews. That's all of us. Maccabee is Micha Who is like you, Hashem? Why is Hashem so special? Be'ilim Hashem. So Be'ilim means in the powers there is Hashem. Now, in Kabbalah, it teaches a very deep thing. As voters are, all the negative forces in the world, all the most destructive forces, they actually get their, their yonik, they get their source and energy from Hashem himself. Your fear, your trauma, your doubt, your lust, your ego, they are all living on divine energy for corrupting it. That means, as we said, the desire for lust, which is chasing that cake or chasing that person, right? the, the cake actually has sparks of divinity within it. And therefore, the lust is, is actually chasing the sparks of divinity, except it's in the lavish, it's got a clip, it's got a shell that says the pleasure is coming from the food, it's not coming from the divinity. And that creates the illusion that gets me addicted to the cake or addicted to the pursuing of my desires in any way, rather than seeing the divinity that my desires are really trying to connect to. Does that make sense? And the all healing of desires is to realize is actually a beautiful form of, of fear which, which the destructive nature of fear took and, and used but corrupted. There's a beautiful form of lust, right? We can lust after holy things, of healthy things, right? But, but that, that, that light of divinity 
get, get, get of, 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 of desire, to desire in a beautiful way, which, which my heart can motivate me to desire in a beautiful way, and a holy way, but that gets in, encased and you know, captured and, 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 and hijacked and used in challenged in a destructive way. So, Hashem, Hashem, who is like you, that in the Be'elim Hashem, that even in the fallen parts of me, there is Hashem as well. You're so pervasive. You're not just above. You're even in the physical world. You're even in the desires. So Yehuda Maccabee means that I have to reveal, turn the light back on with all the desires, with all the emotions, with all the candles, bring the chokhmah, bring the bitl, bring the, bring the shimish back, a little light and a little humility to all of the intellect, to all of the emotions, and therefore you turn the light back on within them one at a time, one at a time, until you become a ner, havaya ekia, havaya elokim, havaya andus, until your whole being, your head, your, your soul, your head, your, your full heart and your body become illuminated. That means you can now see the divinity within you. You're not seeing the world from your own ego needs, but your, your ego needs are now serving the higher self. That's Shemesh Tamar Chachman, Shemesh Chachma. And then from that place, you begin to see divinity, the Chachman, the circle, Shemesh the Bar, and you begin to turn on all the lights of everything in the world, of everyone you interact with. Fine. That's the kind of thing I wanted to say. Any more questions for now? Yes. Um, why don't you ask about this hole? About what? This hole. Yes. It, it seems to me that if we're completely self-effacing, then we're also facing a reality that are showing us as human beings that have to be somewhat selfish. So I'll give an example. Go on. Um, there's a lot of singles today. So, they could just be in the box. I'll say, Hashem, whatever you want. I'll live this way the rest of my life. Or they could get in touch with, and they could take care of myself. I have a need to find my other half. So out of that self awareness. Is there the only two options? What? Hashem, whatever you want, even if I die miserable and alone. Hashem, I have ego needs. Please help me get mine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in the middle, obviously. What, what, what does that look like? Well, it's between and Netzach. Netzach and Hoy together. So how, like, how do we live our lives in a nullified way without, um, let me say this, if you don't have some ego, then we're never going to get in touch with all those I, I, I'm not sure how you're using the word ego, but it's not accurate from a Torah perspective. Ego is, is that which is opposite to the truth. But will and intent are the soul's desire in this world, which are, aligns with value and goodness and truth. So my soul's desire in the world can say, I learned to what is good, what is valuable, what is right, what needs to be. What are the challenges I see in the world? What are the challenges in my own life? I want to get married, and if I'm not married, I'm very upset. Why do you want to get married? Because all my life I feel pathetic and unwanted, and unless someone says that I'm wanted, I will never be of value. Hmm. Is that ego? Is that das? Is that soul? I mean, I hope that girl gets married just because... I want good for her. But where's that coming from? What is that? Is my source of self-value have to be determined by another? Is that the only way forward? Is there a beauty in marriage unto itself? Is there a beauty of a contribution I can make through marriage that is meaningful? Yes. Is it there for an emotional ego need? <clears throat> I'm not looking down. I'm not turning the lights out on the girl that says, I feel pathetic unless someone will choose me. She should be less that someone should choose her. Period. But, but vis-a-vis -vis my own avoda, my own inner work, wherever we're up to, Hashem is always looking for us to clarify our desires, purify and refine our desires, constantly, 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 constantly. That's the work of Biro Hadas. That's the work of Tikkun Amidus. That's the work of Tikkun Oilam. That's the work of being Mechachva down into my being and down to all of my Amidus. Why do I want what I want? And could I shift that a little? Could I open that a little, expand that a little, purify 
Hello, Makadish myself, Machanach myself. So it's not a question of what's right or wrong. It's more the question of what is the work that person has to do. Metoich lilishma bolishma. The key is, it's not so much the ego, because a soul can also desire to be married. And your consciousness will affect what happens to you. The law of attraction. So that means what I'm looking to do is align myself ever, ever deeper with my soul's intent. And I can move forward when I have ego within me. I can. But that will always create some kind of challenge later. And when I find the ego, I can look to identify it, to refine it, to educate it, to re-harness it, to realign it, right? That when I want to achieve the best, deepest things in my life, I don't just want them, but I want them for the right reason. And the more that I want it, I want it for the right reason, the more blessing and success the outcome often is. And it doesn't mean if I want marriage for the ego reasons, I'll never get married. It doesn't mean that I'll never have a good marriage, but it means that that's always challenge that will have to be refined in some way. So I kind of answered your question in a roundabout way. Can you put the pieces together? Fine. It's very, very light. I started very light, and I apologize. Of course, I want to do meditation, because that's kind of what we're here for. But I also don't want to go too late over. Any other key important questions that someone's going to have an emotional breakdown if they don't answer right now? Now everyone's way too embarrassed to put up their hand, aren't they? <laughs> Besides the emotional breakdown, anyone just have questions that they would like to ask at this moment? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Yes. What is the determining the spiritual, the holy sparks inside the long thoughts or feelings? Do you need to be in a big state of expanded consciousness? That is a whole technique. We've discussed it many times. There's tons of stuff online about that. If you're in my WhatsApp group, we just sent out a message, a 30-minute class explaining how that works practically. I'm happy to teach that to you practically another day. It's called the Halot to Mount Shabbos. It's a beautiful technique. You probably see me do it at the Shabbos Street. I was doing it with people in front of your eyes all the time, but I didn't break that down into the system. And I'm happy to go into that another time. I, I want to do, I was going to do a long meditation with you. I, I can't do that now because of the lightness, and we'll come back and we'll do a, God willing, a complete meditation session only next week, okay? It's a little divided but it's always good to have a balance, but that's how the flow came today. I just want to show you one thing very quickly. Could everyone just put your hands together like this for a second? And if you know how to get into Yusha a little mindfulness, a little bit more advanced, and you get into Devakis, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to spend exactly two minutes Quieting your mind, opening your heart, opening a little light in Kedusha. If you've never been to one of our sessions before, you've never heard anything in mindfulness in your life, I don't know what generation you're living in, close your eyes, think of two moments or memories in your life where you felt deeply loved and safe and connected. Two different memories. And I want you to close your eyes and visualize the first one in details and colors and sounds about how you felt loved and safe, who was there, where were you, where were you standing, what you were hearing. Then after about 10 seconds, I want you to move to the second one. I want you to bring that up, the memories, the details, the colors where you were, how much love you felt, what the experience was like. Then I want you to go back to the first and the second, the first and the second. Just enjoy bouncing back and forth into experiences of love and let your body enter into that. Everybody else, keep doing whatever you're doing with the vacas. Use the ladder, the sulam, the makava, popping bubbles, whatever you've used before. This Cassius, choose and believe you're connected to the soul of everybody in this room on the count of three. 
Choose it and believe that you are. One, two, three. Do it again right now. It chooses you. Connect everyone in the room. You give them some of your consciousness and your light and you receive from them as well. As well. She says, all is one. How does that work? Your mind does not understand, nor does mine. Just choose it and believe it, and it will be done. One, two, three. They are one now. Beautiful. Higher and deeper. Keep going in your own way. Choosing to share this consciousness, this task with everyone else watching online right now or listening to the MP3 as well. I am in deeper, I am in deeper. Choose to connect to the ground, to your shalayim, the kadush of your shalayim, to draw that into our consciousness together. Choose to bring in Rosh Chodesh, the energy of Rosh Chodesh right now, of the feminine renewal, the elevation of the feminine energy, showing down the life in Keta. Choose the power of Hanukkah to flood this room, to flood this group right now. To get a light of candle within. <laughs> yud hey vav hey, aleph hey yud hey, yud hey and vav hey, aleph lamad hey yud mem, yud hey vav hey, aleph dalad nun yud, nun yud. All the way down to the goof, to the dam and dam. Wonderful. I want you to open your eyes and keep your energy with you. One, two, three. I want you to put your hands together, facing palms together. I want you to choose right now the next two minutes that there's a tremendous electricity and energy running between them. We talked about the sources for this many, many times from Kabbalah, from Basidus, from Tanakh, from the Nevi'im. Choose, it helps to visualize that there's a light coming down from Keta, in your mind, from your heart to your arms, so you can feel the light, the energy moving between them. Least even just the pressure from palm to palm. Just ask that that will increase now. If you feel it, great. If you don't feel it, just move your hands a little closer together so you get a little traction. If you feel it strong, you can let your hands open up a bit more. Slowly, slowly opening. Shpir Chias, Shpir Shefa, to the Adain. It's very deep thing that the Kohanim wash their hands before the Avoda, face the Migdash. And if you see them wash their hands before doing the Avoda of the Menorah, to purify them, things in the world that we've absorbed into our hands that stop us from feeling the energy in Kedusha. I'll show you that right now, what happens. And the kind of three choose for the energy to increase and double. Just ask Hashem, don't beg Hashem. Just fix an intent that that light and energy, the Chiyas and Shefa, should flow into my hands and increase right now. One, two, three. Say yes if it did. Say it more loudly if it did. Yes. Keep going. Wonderful. On a scale between one to ten, when one ten represents very powerful, one represents nothing at all. How much can you feel that lighter energy now? On the count of three, say that number out loud. One, two, three. Fine. 
I want everyone to look at their right hand right now. Choose as you look at the hand to feel Hashem's light within you. Feel it in your body, feel it above your body. I want you to realize the right hand is the divine hand with you. It's the reveal, reveal of Hashem's infinite light, of infinite love. It has the power right now of infinite light, of infinite love. It has the power of good, of joy, of love, of divine revelation, of kindness. All the good in the world is done with Hashem's energy of His right hand, the middle of chesed, of infinite love. There's so much good and light in your right hand. Look at it right now. Allow the energy of the right hand to expand. Fall in love with it. Feel how the joints work, the bones work, how it all works together to express the will of your consciousness in the world. If you feel it's a little bit more illuminated, say yes now. Yes. Okay, I want you to turn to your left hand. This is the evil hand. It's the force of darkness, of pain, of gavora, of din, that which hurts, that which causes suffering. It represents Hashem disconnecting from us, which creates room for holocausts, trauma and tragedy. Core problems come from the left hand. Core pain comes from the left hand. Do you have any scars on your hand there that you can see? Maybe as you see, that's quite inferior. If you feel less energy in this hand right now, say yes. yes. If you feel less energy, say it louder. Yes. yes. If you feel less connection between those two hands, say yes. yes. Fine. Do you see what we do with our beliefs? Mm -hmm. See how we can turn the light out with our beliefs? I want you to look back to your left hand. I want you to apologize to it. I apologize for what I said. It's not really true at all. I was just illustrating something to you. <laughs> the left hand is really the force of the strength for transforming the world back to divine light. Mm -hmm. That means it's Hashem being strong when he has to be. It's being forceful when we have to be. It's creating barriers and boundaries when they're appropriate and they're very much appropriate, especially in relationships. It's having discipline. It's having consistency. It's the vessels. When there's no vessels in this world, there's no revelation in this world. It's the fear. When our fear is channeled to protect us and keep us safe to feel awe, to feel humbled before something much greater than ourselves. Thank your left hand. Thank your left hand for all it's held, all the pain it's had to carry, all the strength it's needed to endure. The left hand is the part of Hashem who's teaching us, who's building us. But when he's not being loving, he's doing it He's doing it for our own good because he believes in us and he's building us. The left hand is that which builds you and that which builds the world. It's strong enough to confront challenge and hold the pain and bring it back to good. Say thank you to your left hand. It's very, very powerful. It's very, very strong. Stare at it with appreciation and gratitude. Ask it to raise up. The vessel should be raised up. When we light the menorah, when day turns to night, it's because Hashem believes in the night that He wants to bring the light to it and illuminate. When we light the menorah in the doorstep, from the peace of our house to the chaos of the external world, it's because Hashem believes in the external world enough that he wants us to shine light to it and illuminate. 
and Hashem told us to create Hanukkah at the end of the period of the temple, the period of revelation, as we go into the free fall of pain of 2,000 years of disconnection exile. It's because Hashem believes that here in this exile we're going to know ourselves and find ourselves and reveal Hashem in the deepest, deepest way possible. As Jews, we don't just have to believe in Hashem's light, we have to believe in Hashem's darkness as well. Bring the hands back together, let them support each other. I'm going to ask you now to fix an intent. Take a couple of minutes until it's activated. This is in the mystical text, and just bring it down the most practical way, but they use the example of hands as well. The goal is that the light of the right should embrace, support, and hold the darkness of the left. So the light of your soul should illuminate the darkness of your heart to turn the power of the heart back to good. And all the powers that are hidden in the darkness, they should be revealed and turned back to good. So I want you to commit that all the force of light within you should hold and transform the forces of darkness within you. That's called Kusume Nisa, to reveal the light and the darkness. That all the forces of light that you contain as a Neshama, as a Yid in this world, you should use to shine out into the world as a whole and turn it to good. I'm going to ask your Neshama, more than your mind right now, to choose this. And if your Neshama chooses this in the next minute or two by itself, the hands will come together until the right hand is holding and supporting the left hand. Hold your hands up, facing each other. If you choose this with your heart, this will happen by itself with your hands. Let them start to come together in the right way and let the left one be vulnerable and be held and supported by the right one. When you're ready, when you choose it, it'll begin to happen by itself. And pray that all the darkness itself in the world should be revealed to be light. Let them come together in their own time. The small, the inter-included, and returned to the Amin. Slowly, slowly coming together. Believe in the power of your right. Believe in the power of your left. Believe there's a shem in the light. Believe there's a shem in the darkness. Those two waters are yearning for each other. The waters below and the waters above. Das Tachton, Das Elyon. Shine the light onto the streets. The Hasidim put the light in the house. Because the Ikka Pesume Nisa, illuminating the darkness, is within our own house, within our own hearts. Ne'er ish obeysa. Ne'er is the neshama, ish is the das, base. It's the heart, the darkness. Slowly coming together. <coughs> Let the right hand slowly cradle the left. Let the light of the right illuminate the darkness of the left. Choose for them to come together now. Let them come together now. Bring them together now. In that action, allow the light of your neshama to illuminate your bina, purify your thoughts, your beliefs about the world that are wrong, your beliefs about yourself that are wrong. Purify and illuminate your heart. Think of places of challenge in your life, let the light come in and hold and cradle the darkness. Kiss the darkness till it reveals the light. Shine into the darkness till it reveals its light. Bring both those hands to your heart. Shine unto them in the whole of the world. Pray for the world. Shine out from this group to the whole of the world, anyone that needs it right now. For two minutes, we'll call it a session.
As Rabbi Nachman says, if you believe you have the power to destroy, believe you have the power to build. If you believe you have the power to turn the lights out, believe you have the power in your consciousness to turn the light back on. The dedicating and rededicating yourself to the light within you every day. And being machanach, your midas and the darkness to reveal that light. There's not much colors left. By the time we get to Purim, we realize there was never any colors there at all. The whole thing was light the whole time. The dinam returned to the chasadim. It's called Yechud Hashem, and they were all one. Yamu Yeh Hashem Achad Hashem Achad Malah Aretz Deres Hashem. Lights will be back on, and we'll all be home. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Okay, go pick up your kids, whatever you have to do. <laughs> Check those 400 WhatsApp messages. <laughs> sure, Lama <laughs> Everyone just stays in their chair for one second. Stay in your chair for one second. You want to use my phone? It's probably better quality, I think. There you go. And action. And action. If you're awake, do you want to send a picture? I'm using you, sir. All right, ladies, can I see you? Wow, there was only supposed to be 10 people. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. That's awesome. No. Maybe two weeks. Um, we have a WhatsApp group now if people want the details for it. I don't actually know what it is. Um, but you can get regular updates about the things we're doing. Your donations would be greatly appreciated.